the earth will shout. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God God. You know, 
I feel the Spirit just saying, come, come, come before me, come before me. All the earth and all creation sings forth His greatness. How much more should we? Hallelujah. Age to age he stands. Time is in his hands. Beginning and the end. Beginning and the end. The God had three in one. Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God? Sing with me, how great is our God? And all will see how great, how great.
your love is extravagant your friendship I find I'm moving to the rhythms of your grace. Your fragrance is intoxicating in our secret place. Your love is extravagant. Your love. Extravagance, your friendship, mm, intimate. I find I'm moving to the rhythms of your grace. Your fragrance is intoxicating in a secret place. Spread wide in the arms of Christ is the love that covers sin. No greater love that I've ever known. You considered me a friend should my heart again
Well, this morning, last couple Sundays, I've been sharing about the battle that goes on between, that goes within our mind, the battles we struggle with within our mind, how to overcome the battles and struggles within our mind. But this morning, I'm going to uh, share on the miracle story of Purim, the book of Esther. And although Purim actually occurred uh, this past week, Thursday, it began Thursday evening, and it goes two days into Saturday evening, um, I'm still going to share on it. Amen? And I was going to finish up with one more message on the battles that were within our mind, but uh, I was battling in my mind which one to preach. <laughs> and the Lord shared with me that I should really speak on this. Purim is a unique holiday. Well, let's just pray. Father, I just give thanks, Lord God, for where you're bringing us and discoveries we're beginning to learn as far as the foundations of our faith and the Jewish people, Lord, your chosen people, Lord, the Bible, the word of God, the truth of God's word that was written by and for the Jews, Lord God, and Yeshua being a Jew himself, Lord, how we have missed and lost a lot of the meaning behind the truths of your word because we have, through history, through church history and things, have just uh, not acknowledged not acknowledge the, the fact and the truth of, of where your word has come from, which is from you, Lord God, but also through your chosen people. And Lord, we give thanks that we now have been grafted in, grafted in through Yeshua's death, burial, and resurrection, that we are now a part of that family of God. And so, Lord, we give thanks. I give thanks, Lord God, for this opportunity to be used of you, Lord God, to bring forth and share your word. And Lord, may our hearts and our minds be cleared of even traditional beliefs that would hinder and block the truth of your word as you give it to us, O oh Lord. And Father, may this word penetrate our heart and our spirit this morning. In Yeshua's name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Purim is a unique holiday of the Tanakh, whereby it is not like the other holidays by which we celebrate the feast days, which are the feast days being appointed times of God. Amen. We've learned that. And the Lord even says that these days are my days. The feast days are my days. By my days, it doesn't, doesn't say that they're Jewish days, that they belong just to the cho chosen people. But mine means if we are his, they belong to us as well. Amen? Amen. But this day is a holiday that is set aside. It is different. It's not one of the appointed set times that we read about in the Torah. Amen? But as a national day of celebration whereby the Jewish people are grateful to God for saving them from complete and total annihilation. And how many of us, when we look at history, we've constantly seen how the Jewish people have been persecuted time and time and time again over the history. Amen? Throwing out, being thrown out of their own nation, and then scattered abroad, and then even being persecuted among other places that they have gone, thrown out of Spain in 1492 with their money even being used to fund Christopher Columbus' trip here. Amen? God's hand is behind them and protecting his chosen people all through history, just as he protects us, his chosen. Amen? So what is Purim about? Well, Purim means lots as in casting lots. And it refers to an incident that is referred to in the book of Esther, whereby a man by the name of Haman, or Haman, a political official under the king, decided he was going to extinguish the Jewish people. And because Haman, being a suspicious pagan, decided the best way to figure out to extinguish the Jews was to cast lots. Casting lots based upon those lots, they would determine the best time it would be to follow through with his plan. And so we begin to see this almost like fortune telling type of thing, incident occurring here, where he's depending on the casting of lots to bring him success. And upon casting the Purim, the lots, he came up with the 13th day of Adar on the Jewish calendar. But as we will see from the book of Esther, Haman's plans were foiled, thus leading to the celebration of Purim. Now, according to the Tanakh, it is, like I said, a two-day celebration that begins on the 14th and ends on the 15th of Adar. So what is the miracle of Purim that is celebrated? 
Well, in order to find the answer, we need to turn to the book of Esther. Now, what many people may not realize, unless you came to the Bible studies we were doing on the history of the Bible and the history of the church, is that the book of Esther never mentions God's name. Never mentions it. And it's interesting to also note that with the Dead Sea Scrolls and the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls, all the books of the Tanakh, of the Old Testament, were found at the Dead Sea Scrolls with the exception of one book. Guess which book that is? The book of Esther, right? Now, with that being said, one may consider maybe that the book of Esther doesn't carry much weight. And maybe even consider it a godless book since it does not mention the name of God. But the fact is, even with God's name never being mentioned, he is still a part of the message in the book of Esther. Amen. The book portrays more or less a soap opera form of trouble where everything goes crazy in a matter of days. And the drama begins to build and it spirals out of control to where we see the lifestyles of the rich and famous, political chaos and jealousy. We see people striving for positions and the want of recognition leading to self-absorption and pride. Darkness begins to reign in that area, in that kingdom, and the presence of God is never mentioned. The name of God is never mentioned. So because the name of God is never mentioned, is the book of Esther to be considered less than the other books that appear in the Bible? Absolutely not. In fact, when we begin to look at the book of Esther, we will begin to see the hand of God moving quietly behind everything. Turning everything upside down in order to work everything out for his good. It's where God becomes real enough that we don't have to refer to him that he is there. It's a lesson there. That even in a time of exile, even when it appears to be a time of separation, the miracle of Purim is seen when our relationship with the Lord matures to the point to where we become stronger than weaker. Now when we speak of the miracle behind Purim, understand it is more of a hidden miracle. It's not so blatant and obvious as the parting of the Red Sea, the sun standing still, and all these kind of miracles where you see them and go, wow, that's a miracle of God. But a culmination of many events that leads to a miraculous outcome. So let's take a look at the series of events that play out in a kind of fast-paced theatrical drama that leads to this miraculous outcome. And the story begins in a banquet hall of King Osiris, where he gave a great feast to all his royal subjects, officials, and servants in his 127 provinces. His kingdom was huge, extremely big. And at the same time, Queen Vashti is also having a banquet with the female subjects of these royal officers. So they're off doing their own thing, having each their own banquet, their own celebration. And after 180 days, that's right, 180 days they partied. They had this feast, this banquet. And after 180 days, it comes to an end. How many have partied for 180 days? How many are willing to admit that they partied for 180 days? Right? Maybe in your college days or whatever. But, uh, but this banquet comes to an end when Queen Vashti refuses the king's command of coming before the guests and presenting herself before his guests. See, the king saw how beautiful she was. That's why she was the queen. And because of her great beauty and who she was, he calls for her after 180 days of drinking and eating and all this stuff. He wants his guests to see his trophy wife. He wants them to all see how beautiful she is and how adorned in jewels and the crown to come in before him. And she refuses. She refuses her husband. She refuses the king. Now, all his guests who are also officials of their regions, the providences that even though they're under the king, they have their wives there partying with her. And they look at him and they say, hey, listen, this isn't such a good idea. I mean, your own wife, she's not obeying and listening to you. Uh, what kind of lesson is she teaching our wives? And so they were more or less pressuring the king to do something 
about this disobedience. So to make a long story short, her refusal leads to her dismissal as the queen. And so now the king needs a new queen. And so beautiful women from all the provinces begin to parade themselves before the king. And Esther is chosen because of her great beauty. And therefore, she becomes the next queen. Next, we see Mordecai. Mordecai is related to Esther. Actually, Esther's parents, mother and father, had passed. And Mordecai had raised her since she was a young child and looks at her as a daughter. But he starts hanging around now the courtyard in order to keep his eye on her. While hanging out in the courtyard, the king's gate, Mordecai overhears a plot to assassinate the king. And so he goes and he tells Esther, who then in turn tells the king. And after the king hears this, he calls for an investigation to these allegations. They find these allegations to be true, and these men then are taken into custody and hung in the gallows. Now, why is this important? Later on, we will see. Then there's a series of events that lead to the promotion of Haman because of this, who becomes a very powerful official under the king. When Haman would enter the courtyard, the people would all bow to him, with one exception. And who do you think that is? Mordecai. When Haman sees that Mordecai will not bow down to him, he learns that he is a Jew. And Haman decides instead of dealing with just Mordecai, well, he's going to deal with the Jews. And his plan is to basically wipe them out from the kingdom. So Haman convinces the king that the Jewish people are an enemy of the king. And so therefore they must be eliminated, but not only would they be eliminated, but their riches and their goods and all these things would be used to bring up the coffers and the treasury. So the king gives a stamp of approval. And here's where the casting of lots of Purim takes place in deciding when this fateful day would take place, which becomes the 13th of Adar. In Haman, or Haman, we see a familiar spirit. A familiar spirit that is identified throughout scriptures and seen even throughout our world today. That spirit which demands homage, an unhealthy respect, an unhealthy reverence, which desires to be worshipped. And do we not even see that in our world today? One not need to look any further than the news on television, right? With our political system and those who are leading not just our country, but leaders throughout the world. That spirit which has shown itself in the likes of Adolf Hitler, Stalin, Saddam Hussein, Kim Jong-un, and the list can go on and on where these other leaders of other nations demand the homage of their people. They demand the respect. There are pictures and statues of them all over the nation, where if they did not pay homage to them, they would be considered enemies of the state and possibly face death. We see in the scriptures where Daniel refused to bow, did he not? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refusing to bow down to false idols refusing to bow down to anyone or anything other than the one true God. How many idols do we bow down to unknowingly or maybe knowingly? Do we respect and honor and love the Lord our God and put him first and foremost, or are we caught up with putting other things first? We also see it at the start of even Yeshua's ministry. In Luke 4, 1 through 12, and I've shared this before, I'm going to share it again. Let's read. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. How many know that when we become into a weakened state, sometimes we succumb to things we wouldn't normally succumb to? Yep. Right? We fall victim sometimes of things because we are in a shaken state, a weakened state, or in a state of unawareness. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. Did Satan have the power to give this to him? Yes, because he's the ruler of this world, right? But yet he says to him, 
I will give it all this authority and this glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will. If you will then worship me, it will all be yours. Well, how I many you know that Jesus, it's already his anyway, right? It belongs to Yeshua anyway. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only will you serve. And then he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And what is the enemy trying to do here? He's trying to put us to the test. Will we obey God? Will we put him first and foremost in our life? Or will we choose the ways of this world? What is the enemy trying to do? He's trying to make Yeshua, Jesus, bow down and worship him. How many even stories and testimonies have we heard from even rock musicians and all these types of people who have basically come out and said that they basically sold their soul for popularity and for wealth and fame to the devil? Amen? Words coming out of their own lips. Yeah, it's the same spirit as Haman. It's the same spirit, only trying to make God bow down to him and allow his commands. That's what he's trying to do here with Yeshua. Get the Son of God to bow down to him. And it's the same Haman spirit that we see operating even in our world today, where people in positions of authority and power neglect the authority and power of God to where they believe that God should submit to their commands. Let me just share, I don't know if you've seen the news, but during some of these confirmation processes, there's a man or woman, whatever, Dr. Rachel Levine, who's the first transgender to uh, be nominated for a position in the cabinet, in Biden's cabinet. And they, the point I want to make here is how they came against Rand Paul in calling him transphobic attack because he questioned, and he basically came out and said, we should be outraged that someone's talking to a three-year-old about changing their sex. Now, by law, if you're 18 years old and older, you don't need parental consent. Under 18, you need parental consent. But there has been talk of lowering that age down to 10. And they believe that people between the ages of 3 and 12 have enough sense, common sense, to make a decision whether or not they want to change their genders. You're not going to find that on much news, but I'm telling you, this is what their plan is. How do I know? Because I've been reading behind the scenes of things with po politicians are outraged by some of this, and others are all for it. So there's a divide, there's a split going on within our nation. And, and what they're saying is that with the age of 10, you don't need parental consent. That you can have blocking hormones given to a child of 10 years old, okay, without the parents knowing. To me, that is, that is outright wrong. I don't care what your stance is on all of this, but it's wrong. Amen. But anyway, what I'm saying here is, is this is where things are heading. And so we need to have our ears open. Can you imagine a three-year-old being discussing with a three-year-old? That's my, the age of my granddaughter, my youngest granddaughter. And, and to be able to make that kind of a decision? Where were you when you were 10 years old? Amen? Did you think you had the capacity at 10 years old to make a life-changing decision like that that cannot be reversed? And so here's where things are at. And so he was criticized greatly because of the stance that he was taking in regards to this. See, they are basically trying to be their own God. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they will not tolerate anyone who says anything against their ideologies. And will silence those who go by the moral standards laid out in the word of God. And we wonder why our nation is becoming such a mess. Now getting back, we have Mordecai who refuses to bow down and pay homage to Haman, who now becomes enraged. He's angry. And when Mordecai hears of Haman's plan, he sends word to Esther and tells her, you need to go to the king in order to stop this genocide that is about to occur. And through her servant, Esther responds to Mordecai, and here's what she says in Esther 4.11. 
All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter to that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. So Esther realizes that what Mordecai is asking of her is dangerous. It's life-threatening. Esther is being called to risk her life to give up what she sees for what she doesn't see, what she doesn't know. And that, my friends, is faith. That is what faith requires. Stepping out into the unknown. And there may come a time to fulfill God's call upon your life and my life where we cannot maybe play it safe. Where we may be called to not play it safe. If this were the case, no one in the Bible would ever have fulfilled their calling if they had not stepped out. Come on. These are more than just stories. They're encouragement to us to take the same action, to step out. It's stepping out of your comfort zone. It's stepping out by coming to the Lord and surrendering your life over to him. So here we have Esther living in a palace surrounded by complete and total luxury. Listen, when you become surrounded by complete and total luxury and begin to live with these things, sometimes that can make it even harder to step out and do what's right. Because now there's something that can cost you. It can become extremely easy living in a palace of comfort and luxury to where you stop taking risks and stop taking God seriously. Stop stepping out for God. Even to the point of becoming lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Amen? Allowing it to become a place where your life becomes so comfortable that your walk with God dies. And here, I've seen it firsthand where people who have Succeeded in life. There was a time when I went on a call where an individual had gone on vacation with their family and then gotten into an argument with his wife, had left the vacation, and what really kind of spurred this whole thing on, what was really going on behind the scenes was he was a young man, not even 30 yet, and he felt he had reached the pinnacle in his life. That there was no nowhere else to go as far as being successful in his life. He had money. He had everything. Beautiful family, children. Had everything going on for him. And yet I get a call to go there and guess what? Took his life. Pictures of his family on his lap. See, sometimes having wealth, fame, and money is not the answer. It's not the answer. It's not going to give you your peace. It's not going to give you a better life, even though you may think it may. Those things can corrupt if you're not in the right frame of mind, a godly mind, a spiritual mind. Amen? Amen. Faith is taking matters without, with a risk. See, without problems or without a victory, where is faith? It's the uncertainty that exercises the certainty of your faith. Let me say that again. Faith is the uncertainty that exercises the certainty of that faith, of your faith. It's where you become so sure of God in times of uncertainty, in times of the unknown, where you become certain of your faith. It's coming to a place in your life where you feel so safe in God. You feel so safe in the presence of God that you can step out. Step out and knowing for certain that God is in control. It's for stepping out knowing for certain that God has this. It's stepping out and knowing for certain that God is watching over and protecting me. It's stepping out and knowing for certain that God will give me the victory because his word says that I am an overcomer. It's stepping out in faith because you know who you are in God. And that's the key. Knowing who you are in God. Knowing your identity in Yeshua, in Christ, in Jesus. Even if the world considers what you do as taking a risk. Come on. 
Mordecai sends back a word to Esther. Esther 4.13. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. In other words, don't think just because you're living in the lap of luxury up there. And just because they right now don't know that you're a Jew, they will find out that you're a Jew. And if they persecute and kill all the Jews, guess what? Your head's going to be on the platter as well. Don't forget where you come from. Don't forget the foundation of who you are. And this, again, I, I caution all of us. Let us not forget the foundations of our faith, where and who we believe in. Amen? Amen. Verse 14, for if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I believe that we are called and living in these days for such a time as this. Amen? Do you believe it? Do you know it? And we're not to operate in a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of what? A sound mind. Now Esther comes to the realization that she can no longer sit tight and do nothing. She calls for the Jewish people, Mordecai, to tell them to join her in fasting for three days and nights. And here's what she says. That I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. I believe that while Esther was fasting for those three days, God gave her a plan in how to approach the king. So many times we feel that we need to stand up and do something right, that we go headstrong into a matter. Never even asking God what it is, the plan that he has for us to do. But Lord, bless what it is I'm going to do, no matter what it is, because I really don't know. I'm just going to let my feelings and emotions get over me, and I'm going to go headstrong into this matter. That's not what she did. I believe she heard from the Lord and she acted in a quiet manner, in a more of a manipulative manner. And all the men in the house going, yeah, yeah, that's what women do. Yeah, I mean, just kidding. Amen? She calls for the Jewish people to join her in this fasting. Esther comes up with the plan and this plan works where she gains access to the king. While in the king's presence, she asks that a banquet be held for the king and for Haman which sounds completely innocent. But see, Esther's intent was to manipulate the king into becoming jealous of Haman. Haman, on the other hand, he's at the top of his game. He is joyfully gloating over the success that's going on and that he and the king have been invited to this banquet to be held by the queen. But even in his joyful state, there is one thing that keeps hindering him, disturbing him, causing a disruption within his spirit, and that is Mordecai. Mordecai won't bow down to him. And here's what I'm saying to you. No matter how successful you are, no matter how, how, what great things that are happening in your life, things can turn to where these things will not make you happy. And here is an example of that Haman spirit where he's, got, he's living on top of the world, but because Mordecai wanted to, will not bow to him, he is outraged, and it disturbs his peace. Now, Haman then goes to his council, and they recommend that, hey, if you're so upset about this, why don't you just build some gallows there in the night in order to hang Mordecai in the morning? Build the gallows, go to the king in the morning, and say, hey, I'm hanging Mordecai, he's an enemy of yours. But here again, we see another event where God's hand begins to move. During the night, while the gallows are being built, the king cannot sleep. And so he asks his royal officials to read him a story from the Chronicles of the Kings. He's getting a bedtime story. The king. The king of Persia. And, and what story do they read to him? The story of Mordecai. <laughs> And how he heard the plot of his assassination, the king's assassination, and how Mordecai basically saves his life. And the king is like, wow, who's this Mordecai? What, did we do anything for this man who heard and, and foiled this plot and basically has saved my life? What have we done for him? Have we rewarded him? And no, no king, no. Ha. Ah, well, we can't have any of that going on, can we? The king wants to reward Mordecai. So the next morning, Haman, knowing that he needs the king's permission to hang Mordecai, 
goes in to see the king, not realizing that the king has now trying to decide how to reward Mordecai. You see the hand of God moving in all of this. And that very morning, as Haman approaches the king, the king asks Haman how he can honor someone. He doesn't tell him who. And Haman, knowing that he's the only one who's invited to this banquet with the king, immediately he thinks what? He thinks the king is thinking of honoring him. That's where pride and arrogance comes into play. Right? And here's what Haman, Haman says. Esther 6, 7. And Haman says to the king, remind you, he's thinking of himself as being the one honored. He says, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. And then the king said to Haman, Boom! Right? Hurry, take the robes and the horse as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. Ba-boom, right? I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall to see the face of Haman, right? Hearing this news drop down on him. And so here we see the hand of God in play again for Haman. Instead of hanging Mordecai on the gallows, is now dressing Mordecai in the king's robes, placing him on the king's horse, and parading him around the kingdom on the king's horse in a ceremony of honor with the crown on his head. While all this is taking place, and when they get done, Haman goes to the banquet. Where is he, just, where is he and just the king? And the king now asks Queen Esther, what is your request? What is it that I can do for you? And here's Queen Esther's answer in Esther 7, 3. And Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish, and my people for my request. For we have been sold, and I and my people to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. And now the king asks Queen Esther, who is it that would do such a thing? And she responds, now mind you, here's Haman and the king, the only ones there, the only ones present. And she responds that it is Haman. It's Haman. Boom, there it is, another one. Man, this guy is not having a good day, is he? I mean, as bad as days can be, this is probably the worst one he ever experienced. But we also know that it will also be the last one he experiences. Amen. The king's extremely anger. And he storms off into the palace garden, probably muttering and talking to himself because he realizes that I listened to this guy. I gave the official signal on this thing. I was tricked. I was duped. I was lied to. And so he's probably angry and upset. Meanwhile, Hamon doesn't stay there. I mean, he doesn't take off into the garden. He stays behind and he pleads for his life with Esther. Falling on the couch where Esther is lying, right? And who comes back to see him lying on this couch, pleading for his life with Esther? The king. Esther 7, 8. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said... Will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. That moment, <laughs> he was taken off to the gallows that he was building for Mordecai. Again, you see the hand of God here. What was intended to hang Mordecai is now hanging the very man whose intentions were to kill Mordecai. And now he dies at the hand of the king. At that moment, Mordecai is promoted over the house of Haman. And the Jewish people were delivered from annihilation because of Queen Esther's plea. The miracle that occurs here is where the casting of lots, the Purim, which is a superstitious pagan practice, whereby 
when you listen to this, you're going to be successful. Until you meet Yahovah, until you meet the Lord, the King of kings and Lord of lords, amen, who overcomes that power through a series of events that takes place and spares his people. In this story, we can see similar parallels between the story of Esther and the story of Joseph, where during a time of exile, God worked behind the scenes, did he not? Allowing a series of events to take place which would bring salvation to his people. Joseph was taken captive, right? His brothers threw him in a pit. They sold him off to, in Egypt to be a slave. And he's taken captive. And he becomes, goes from being a slave to a prisoner in jail to second in command under Pharaoh. Only God can do that. And Esther, also held in captivity, now becomes the queen of Persia. In both cases, we see where Joseph realizes what happens to him. That he realizes that it's God's divine plan. His brothers were afraid and scared and nervous when they came and found out that the one who was giving them the grain was their brother whom they betrayed, whom they sold off as a slave. And he said, hey, don't worry about it. This wasn't your doing. I mean, it was, but it wasn't. You only did something that God needed to use in order for me to be in the position that I am to bring salvation to our people during this time of famine. So I hold nothing against you. You acted out in doing what God had already orchestrated since I was a child. You remember the dreams I had of everyone bowing down? Well, my childhood dream has been fulfilled. Amen? God working matters out in one's life. The fulfillment taking place. Mordecai now recognizes the hand of God playing out in the life of Esther, believing that she was born for such a time as this, to reign in the king's court in order to be used to spare the lives of God's people. But both Joseph and Esther needed to take action. They needed to respond and not stay silent in order to be used by God in fulfilling God's plan. And it's the same for us. However, we need to take action and respond to the injustices that are occurring around us. But respond and take action not maybe in the way we think it should be taken. Yeah. Hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We need to ask God when to fight, when not to fight, when to take action, when not to take action. Keep in mind that just as God's name is hidden in the book of Esther, Esther's Jewish identity was also hidden until the right time. Amen. Even though both identities were hidden, both identities were operating quietly Behind the scenes. Amen? Exposing what needed to be exposed at the right time and with great precision. See, God does it with excellence. Think about it. How many people, how many of you even here today have never noticed that God's name was never mentioned in the book of Esther? Why? Because you always see God's hand moving in the book of Esther that you don't even come to the realization that God's name is never even mentioned in the book of Esther. But you know he's there. That's the miracle, right? You know he's there. Hallelujah. Quietly moving. And this is how the Lord operates and moves in our life as well. He moves and acts quietly behind the scenes of our life. Even though the Lord's name is never mentioned in the book of Esther, it is a book that speaks of all the times in your life when maybe you didn't feel the presence of God. When you didn't hear the voice of God, when you didn't see the hand of God working behind the scenes in your life, when there seemed to be no sign of God's love breaking through anywhere, when he appears to be so far away, when all there is is darkness, and it appears that there is nothing happening, that you see no light at the end of the tunnel. But here is the miracle of Purim recorded in the book of Esther, that even though you don't feel his presence, it's knowing he's still there. Even when you don't see his hand, it's still moving. Even when you don't hear his voice, he's still speaking. Even in the silence, when you feel that you've been abandoned and you are alone, his love is still there. It's like that picture, remember? On the beach, the footprints. Why was there only one set of footprints? And the Lord responds, because I was carrying you. And even when it seems hopeless, and your emotions don't feel anything. 
He's right there beside you, working. Working quietly behind the scenes with precision. And every detail of your life for the purposes of God, for your redemption. Remember, God works all things to good, right? God works all things for good in the life of those who, what? Love him and are called according to his purpose. Even though it doesn't appear to be good, and maybe what's happening around us doesn't appear to be good, know that God is bringing everything around for his good. And like Haman, allowing people to do and whatever it is they're going to do, and possibly even hang them themselves. Amen? Amen? Even as the book of Esther ends with celebration and victory, so shall the lives be ones of celebration and victory for us. There's an old joke that many of the Jews say at every Jewish holy day that has this theme. They tried to kill us. God delivered us. So let us eat. (laughs) Amen. The truth is, it's about the light of God breaking through the darkness and bringing us into his marvelous light and the good prevailing in the end, even when it doesn't seem like he's there. It's about God's redemption, that in the end, his redeeming love for you and I will prevail. Amen? Amen. Amen. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you.
see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. That is who you are.